Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Last summer, egg prices surged. We had the uh, avian flu. Egg prices have since come down and I guess like we've sort of forgotten about it. I haven't. I have not forgotten about well, avian flu. Well, it looms large in my mind as I continue to daydream about becoming a small-scale chicken grower. Well, what is happening with that? Things have improved. I was talking to an ornithologist that I'm friendly with, and he says a lot of the infestations in wild birds seem to have subsided, and okay. that was kind of the vector for infection. But it is interesting, if you look at egg prices, egg prices now have basically normalized yeah. from the record that we saw in sort of, uh, I think it was actually December of last year. So at least from a market perspective, it has faded from recent memory. Right. And so, you know, when we do all these episodes about various disruptions and things that happen and then it goes on and it's sort of like, okay, well, like, can we do it better in yes. the future? Right. Like, did we learn anything from this episode of uh, sort of major disruptions? Is there going to be a change in the law? Is there going to be a change in logistics? Is there going to be a change in supply chains? Like, is there a way to avoid a disruption and an outbreak, the likes of which we saw in uh, 2022. Absolutely. And I remember we recorded that episode with Glenn Hickman, the yeah. president of Hickman Family Farms, which has a bunch of chickens. It's a chicken producer, an egg producer. And I remember he was describing the existing system for handling avian flu. And we got into some of the way it works with him. So he was talking about compensation, mm -hmm. for instance. And from talking to him, it seems like there is room for improvement. There's also a larger question over whether whether or not the U.S. should start just vaccinating yes. its commercial chicken flocks. You know what I didn't know until preparing for this episode? I didn't know Delaware was a huge chicken. <laughs> Did you know that? It's a huge chicken powerhouse state. No, I had no idea. I've driven through Delaware a few times, and I have I have to say I have not noticed a lot of chickens wandering around. But, of course, they wouldn't just be wandering around. They would be in big uh, sort of barn-like structures. I don't know what I would have guessed if someone says, what state do you think? You know, what I, w I don't know, like, what I— Maybe I would have said like Arkansas. I would have guessed Arkansas. Yeah, I, Arkansas, right. Or maybe Texas or one of the southern states. But apparently like Delaware is like this huge chicken powerhouse. All right. Well, we have to dig into why Delaware is a chicken powerhouse and what we can do about future avian flu outbreaks. We do literally have the perfect guest for this episode because we are speaking with uh, Delaware Senator Chris Coons. Who is, uh, and I didn't know this, he is the co chair of the Senate Chicken Caucus, and he is the co sponsor of a bill that they're trying to move forward called the Healthy Poultry Assistance and Indemnification Act, which is trying to, in some way, improve upon the existing system for compensating farmers affected by an avian flu outbreak. Gotta love the Chicken Caucus. Senator Coons, thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. What happens now? to farmers if they are in an area, under current law, in an area where avian flu is discovered? Uh, well, the good news and the bad news is that uh, as a country, we're very good at identifying uh, high pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks or HPAI outbreaks. Uh, and what happens, frankly, is that the farmer whose flock is infected promptly gets a control order, uh, has to depopulate, has to destroy his entire flock and is then compensated uh, by USDA for that. However, under current policy, all the other poultry farms in a six mile radius or a 10 kilometer radius around that HPAI case are not allowed to bring new flocks uh, until the virus is deemed fully contained. So um, let's say you're a poultry farmer and I live two, three miles away and I'm a poultry farmer and you tragically have an HPAI infection, you destroy your whole flock, you get compensated for that. But now I can't have any more uh, turns uh, in my chicken house. I can't bring in any more uh, new flocks and be compensated. That's the current situation. So I remember when we spoke to Glenn Hickman, a, a mid-sized, well, fairly large to mid-sized uh, poultry farmer, he was saying that the other thing that isn't covered is if you need to buy new chickens, for instance, to restock your flock. Are there other associated costs that poultry farmers just aren't compensated for? Yes. My sense is um, that growers undergo significant financial struggles. 
Um, but there is a real gap between those who have a positive HPI case and those who aren't compensated in the same area. Uh, and I am optimistic that working with my friend and partner, Senator Wicker, uh, and the other 15 members from across the country of our bipartisan Senate Chicken Caucus, uh, that we're going to be successful in adding additional compensation um, through the Farm Bill this year. Can I say I am already a fan <laughs> of the Chicken Caucus, uh, and I think a lot of people, when they hear that name, are, are sort of tickled by it. But what does the Chicken Caucus actually do? Well, the Chicken Caucus recognizes uh, that chicken is a really important uh, agricultural product for all of the United States. Uh, it's critical to my home state of Delaware, uh, but across the country, there's 300,000 people who work in the poultry industry. Wow. It generates about $45 billion a year, and there's major operations in about 30 states. Uh, but instead of our having a, a common and cohesive voice in the Senate, uh, when I got here 13 years ago, uh, there really wasn't that. And so my dear friend, our late colleague, Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia, Johnny and I launched the Chicken Caucus in 2013. Um, part of this is just good old home state interests for me. Delaware has 200 times more chickens than people. Hmm. Um, it generates about $7 billion a year in economic activity for my state. It really defines agriculture in Delaware. And in fact, this year we're celebrating uh, the century of the broiler chicken industry in Delaware, which began with an accident. Um, a Mrs. Cecile Steele um, ordered a small number of chickens through a mail order company and got hundreds of them and then ended up actually discovering that because we are so close to New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington, uh, that she could really make a successful business out of raising thousands of chickens a year and now there are millions in Delaware and around the country. I view it as, in many ways, the most important animal protein in our country. And the Chicken Caucus focuses on the opportunities and challenges for export and domestically of the American chicken industry. Joe, did you know that you can still send baby chicks <laughs> through the U.S. mail? I did not know that. Can I just say, so we're recording this episode a little differently, just full disclosure, we were recording the interview first, and we were going to do the intro after. And this was going to be <laughs> the story that I was going to tell on the intro. Because while doing some prep, I read about the story of um, the woman who meant to order 50 chickens and accidentally got 500 chickens and then started a huge industry. And I was going to ask Tracy if this uh, was going this to happen. This is my dream. So, <laughs> yeah, so what happened to Delaware uh, last year during the worst of the, uh, the avian flu outbreak? Well, we had some significant losses. There were uh, poultry growers uh, who weren't able to um, earn the same kind of income they historically had. Um, we did manage to get quick and effective control of the outbreak. Uh, the University of Delaware's uh, Agriculture School has dedicated programs uh, and trained extension agents. The Delmarva Chicken Association and our Farm Bureau have worked very closely together to make sure that uh, everyone in our agricultural community is well aware of the risks of HPAI and how to deal with it. And it, it can have a real impact, uh, both directly in terms of the loss of chickens and revenue, uh, and indirectly in terms of uh, socializing people visiting from one farm to another. But we've got it well under hand. We have a very talented state secretary of agriculture who is well grounded in our poultry industry. And in the end, we've come through it, I think, stronger than ever. So walk us through the the legislation that you're introducing, mm. what it actually does, and how it would differ from the existing form of compensation, which you laid out earlier. It essentially says if you undergo the same financial struggles because of the Department of Agriculture Animal and Plant Inspection Service, um, the APHIS rules in terms of how you deal with HPAI, um, you'll get the same compensation if you're within that six-mile radius and your economic activity is harmed uh, than you would if you actually had a positive mm. uh, outbreak, if mm. you had an infection in your flock. It also simplifies the, the way that you calculate the indemnity payments um, so that growers have greater security. And I'm very excited about Senator John Bozeman, the most senior Republican on the Agriculture Committee, uh, coming to visit us in Delaware um, two Fridays from now. He's going to spend the day uh, visit with some of our producers and growers and 
uh, talk to leaders in our ag industry, and we're going to be talking through exactly what this last HPAI outbreak meant for uh, growers in Delaware and what this legislation uh, would do for us and for all the chicken uh, industry in the country. I am hopeful that with Senator Bozeman's leadership, it will get included in the Farm Bill later this year. Does the bill differentiate at all between large and small farmers? Mm. Because I think a lot of people will think maybe small scale farmers need additional support, but a large company like, say, a Pilgrim's Pride, I mean, they seem to be doing okay just looking at their share price. Tyson Tyson isn't, but uh, I think there are some other issues there. But does it differentiate well, at all? Briefly, no. And let me briefly be clear, the integrated business model for growers um, is quite different. So the vast majority of the farmers in Delaware who are raising chicken have other jobs and they have one or two or three chicken houses on their property. And a company like Purdue or Tyson's brings the chicks to the farm, provides them with a feed, with antibiotics, with um, support and monitoring. And then whenever they've grown uh, fast enough to then be taken back to be processed, they come to the farm and take them away. And so as the poultry grower, as the chicken farmer, what you really own is the house and you provide the supervision, the labor, the, the active maintenance hmm. of the house and, and you tend the flock. That's why part of the focus of this bill is on the economic harm of not being able to have more flocks come through your houses. But there are hundreds of Delawareans who own one, two, or three wow. chicken houses. Uh, and these are assets that are, you know, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So this is really aimed at them. It is really aimed at reducing the economic harm suffered by lots of middle-class working families who are chicken farmers, but who often also have other income, um, but where the impact to them and their family of being shut down for months at a time um, can be significant. Tracy, you really could do this. I did not realize that for a, lo a lot of chickens are produced as someone's like sort of second or third form of income. Yeah, I, I can supplement my Bloomberg salary. Senator, Is just remind me, that model that you just described, is that called contract poultry farming? Yes, the integrated model where you have large processors like Tyson's or Purdue, and then hundreds and hundreds of uh, farmers who are on contract uh, with particular um, uh, processors um, has worked fairly well in Del Mar, but we've got a system where the growers um, have options. They can switch uh, between the five big companies in our region if they want. Huh. Um, and the integrators are responsible for the larger, messier, more challenging, more capital intensive parts of the process, uh, both the hatchery, um, the delivery, the trucking, uh, and the processing of the chicken and the chicken growers um, really are responsible for what's in their backyard, for their chicken house, uh, how it's operated and how it's maintained. Uh, and it's it's worked in our region and it's worked relatively well for a century now. So just to be clear, in terms of the upgrades that your bill would propose, what is the name again, sorry, of the uh, of your new bill? I think it's literally called the HPAI Oh, Act. yeah. Uh, so it so it would compensate farmers who didn't who were affected because they couldn't introduce new chickens in the area it, even if they didn't have a positive test it would simplify the payout on the payout how big is the pot of money total is there is it capped or is it just however much like if there were an, a big national outbreak is there a, is there a cap on how much would be paid out from the uh, the USDA budget I don't know that. I don't think so. But I also, frankly, within the scope of the USDA budget, um, would expect this would be a relatively small mm. line item. So I know traditionally in the U.S., the way we've handled avian flu outbreaks is basically by trying to isolate the cases, destroy the f affected flock, 
and stamp it out that way. But there's some discussion of maybe moving to a vaccine-based model. Mm. And there are other countries that have started to do this, China being a notable example. Is that a viable option for America? Should we, instead of compensating farmers for millions of dead chickens, should we perhaps be looking at mass vaccinations? Well, that, that is something that the USDA is currently considering. They are running uh, HPAI vaccine trials, uh, but there are no currently approved HPAI vaccines. And we have to be careful with this and make sure that there is a global decision about whether or not to move forward uh, with vaccination as the means of addressing HPAI, uh, because it's a truly global market and it's a significant um, portion of Delaware's chicken production and of our U.S. chicken production is for the global market. Um, so the EU, for example, is slated to start vaccinations for poultry soon, whereas the U.K. prohibits vaccinations of poultry. Um, and I think it's critical that efforts to vaccinate American flocks don't have the unintended adverse impact of shutting off key export markets for us around the world. So there are trade relationships that we have that stipulate certain nature of the chickens that get exported, et cetera. And so depending on what happens with the vaccination, that could be in violation, theoretically. Is that the idea? That's right. So there are countries that um, I think are inappropriately um, using HPAI as a as an excuse mm. to stop importing American chicken. Uh, we have long been barred from the Chinese market, for example, which is uh, had been one of our largest and most profitable markets, huh. um, actually, ironically, less for the chicken meat than for the paws. Um, it's something that often surprises audiences when I tell them that in some ways the most profitable part of chicken grown in Delaware is the export of their paws uh, to the Chinese market. That's been shut off to us for a wow. number of years under the flimsy excuse that HBAI, if there are outbreaks uh, in other parts of the United States, justifies uh, barring uh, exports from Delaware. We've tried to get regionalization uh, understood and accepted. If there's an HBII outbreak in Washington state, for example, um, to use that as an excuse to prevent uh, Delmarva chicken from being exported into a market around the world, I think is unjustified. Um, but we also have some countries that have said, if you begin vaccinations, we will bar your chickens uh, from being exported into our country on that basis. Tracy, I'm a big fan of chicken feet, by the way. I so just am I. Yeah. Uh, they're supposed to be good for your skin, too. Lots of collagen. They're delicious. Um, Senator, just on the vaccination point, I believe there are also medical concerns. So the worry is that if you were to vaccinate flocks, that you might still get infections, but they would just be less noticeable. The chickens wouldn't get mm. as sick, and then they would sort of, I guess, become silent spreaders of the disease to unvaccinated birds. That's right. That's a concern with any vaccine is that if it's not sufficiently efficacious, if it doesn't have the impact of stomping out the infection, it can simply lead to it um, spreading more broadly, uh, not being noticed because uh, the carriers are asymptomatic. Uh, and then the long term public health consequences can be significant. Um, so I, I think it's important that the current um, vaccine trials that USDA is undergoing um, be allowed to be thorough and complete. Um, it's a It would be a big change in our policy um, to deal with HPAI through vaccination. And uh, if that comes to pass, we want to make sure that it's uh, medically sound, that it's sound as a matter of public health, and that it's sound as a matter of its potential impact on our poultry industry. Forgive me for asking what may be sort of a politics question, but, you know, you talk about your work with the late Senator Johnny Isaacson. In this case, you're working alongside uh, the senator from Mississippi, Senator Wicker. You know, we were used to as consumers of news hearing about these like huge pitched battles in D.C. that always come down to the last second in areas like this chicken farming, something like this. Is there more of this activity, bipartisan consensus activity than maybe the general public realizes? Yes, Joe, there is. And and frankly, that's one of the reasons uh, I was attracted to forming the Chicken Caucus with Johnny mm. and to continuing to sustain it and lead it, is that it's something uh, that helps pull together senators from across the country 
and from different backgrounds. And look, that's part of the history of the Farm Bill, is that the Farm Bill has long been broadly bipartisan. Uh, the Farm Bill in 2018 got 87 votes. Uh, and my hope is that uh, Chair Stabenow and Ranking Member Bozeman uh, will get that strong a support with this legislation this year. And adding this piece, the HPAI Act, to the Farm Bill uh, would help secure some additional support from around the country. Uh, within my own state, uh, I'm really struck at how organizations that don't necessarily or always support every legislative initiative I take, like the American Farm Bureau Federation or um, the egg producers or the Del Marva Chicken Association, they're enthusiastically in support of this legislation. Uh, at the end of the day, each of us as senators uh, comes here to advance the interests and concerns of our constituents and comes here with some you know, ideological or philosophical bent. Um, I have enjoyed and benefited um, from finding core concerns of my constituents, like the vibrancy of our poultry industry, that really aren't ideological, that really don't have a Republican or Democratic uh, tinge to them, and then finding friends and partners I can work with on things like this. Uh, Roger and I, Senator Wicker and I, have worked on a range of different things, from uh, national service to neglected tropical diseases, um, to the chicken caucus. And that has helped us uh, to find our way towards legislating together on other topics. Since Joe asked about bipartisan support, let me ask the devil's advocate question, which is, why do farmers get extra support for mm. this type of crop or poultry or animal loss? I mean, other people start businesses if there's an act of God of some sort. Maybe they have insurance for it. Maybe they don't. They have to, you know, take on those costs themselves. Why do farmers deserve government support? Tracy, your question presumes that we don't provide billions in subsidies for coastlines uh, that, frankly, we have to pay out every time there's a hurricane season or that we don't provide billions in disaster relief every time there's a tornado or a wildfire or a drought. Uh, and the reality is that we do. Um, farming is very difficult. Um, it is unpredictable. It is dependent on the weather. It's dependent on the markets. Uh, and as you well know, uh, we have the most productive agricultural sector on the planet. Um, and as I have spent time in the developing world in the global south, uh, visiting with smallholder farmers um, whose yields are a tenth of what ours are, um, I have come to appreciate the broad and the deep um, history and the infrastructure here around supporting agriculture. Crop insurance, um, programs for youth like Future Farmers of America and 4-H, um, financing, uh, access to credit, uh, infrastructure, um, investments in hybrids, and developing new seeds and new strains, um, our support federally for uh, agriculture is really remarkable. And that's why we have the safest, most secure, most productive agricultural system in the world. And it's why we not only have enough to feed every American, uh, but we send commodity agricultural products from the United States um, to feed uh, the hungry and the starving around the world. Just a few weeks ago, I was with a bipartisan delegation through the Aspen Institute in Kenya. And we visited both a refugee camp in the far northwest, uh, a remote and difficult and harsh place where there's a quarter million refugees from Sudan uh, being sustained and fed through the World Food Program. And I got to visit a new factory uh, in Nairobi uh, where they're manufacturing something uh, that really was initially piloted here in the United States in factories in Georgia and in Rhode Island that takes peanuts and milk solids and vegetable oil and micronutrients uh, and makes a nearly miraculous paste called clumpy nut um, that clumpy can take nut. children literally clumpy nut. <laughs> and if you want to do a show on clumpy nut, I would be excited. It has the technical term RUTF or ready to use therapeutic food, an acronym only a bureaucrat could love. <laughs> um, but Johnny was very passionate about clumpy nut. I first heard about it from him because Georgia peanut farmers uh, are so supportive of this uh, critical life-saving paste. And I got to visit a pediatric ward in a, a clinic uh, at this refugee camp where tragically children on the edge of starvation 
uh, were being nursed back to health um, through medical interventions. Uh, but when Plumpy Nut is available, and it is in that refugee camp available, um, it can help revive children uh, and adults um, who've been uh, severely and acutely malnourished. So I think it's important for us to recognize that some of the interventions we're providing, like these payments um, to poultry growers, don't just help sustain our poultry economy, don't just help sustain farmers in the United States, uh, but help sustain us as the reserve provider of nutrition to a lot of the world. What is the sort of status? How does it get folded into the farm bill? And what is the sort of like broader industry support that this has? This particular legislation has tremendous support. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the ways in which we have a dozen co-sponsors that are bipartisan, the United Egg Producers, the Farm Bureaus in 18 states, the American Farm Bureau Federation, the National Chicken Council, um, have all supported it, uh, and it would be added to the Farm Bill as an amendment um, if Senators Stabenow and Bozeman uh, endorse it and accept it. It would go into what's called a manager's package uh, as the bill is taken up on the floor or possibly as it comes through committee. Um, but look, if you've got broad bipartisan support for a common sense solution to a problem that could impact poultry growers in 30 states, um, that's exactly the sort of thing that ends up getting done without there being a floor vote just by having it added as an amendment to the bill. So, Senator, I, I want to ask just one more question, which is, you know, last year we had the flu outbreak. We saw the huge run up in egg prices. They've since come crashing down. What are you hearing from Delaware poultry farmers, your constituents? What are their concerns now? Uh, well, their concerns are uh, making sure that they continue to have strong market access. Um, in fact, um, one of the larger egg producers in Delaware um, just got a grant, um, I think we announced it a few days ago, um, to put rooftop solar uh, on um, their chicken houses uh, because energy costs are a big part uh. of egg production and, and poultry growing. Um, one of the real challenges that is a result of these heat waves we're seeing mm. um, that I believe are caused by climate change um, is that maintaining the temperature in a chicken house so that the chickens don't all broil before oh, wow. um, they're done growing and so that eggs can hatch safely, uh, that's a key input. And so the cost uh, of maintaining um, a poultry houses successfully uh, is a big mm. deal. Um, one of the other things um, that we're trying to do is to make sure that um, we continue to have commercial flocks uh, that are viable even though there are detections of um, high pathogenic avian influenza. Um, last year, um, we spent nearly a, a billion dollars on this, but to be clear, we are out of the woods. Um, the last detection in the United States uh, was now back in mm. April, mm. and ongoing surveillance testing of the wild bird population, which is where HPAI comes from, indicates that the virus has subsided for now. So um, I do want to say just how grateful I am and uh, many of us are for APHIS and, and the Department of Agriculture for what they do to help make sure that uh, poultry growers aren't driven out of business by these uh, outbreaks, that they're identified, that they're managed properly, they're contained, and then we're able to go back uh, to enjoying uh, America's most affordable, hmm. uh, most ecologically sustainable, highest quality um, food protein, um, which is chicken. Senator Coons, thank you so much for joining us. Until this, had no idea there was a Senate uh, Chicken Caucus. And uh, we're going to maybe spawn several more follow-up episodes. So appreciate you coming on Odd Lots. I am actually holding a bejeweled large chicken that Johnny and I bought together in Nigeria. So if we, oh, that's if awesome. you ever want some visuals for the podcast, you yes. just let me know. Absolutely. Thank you. Tracy, I really enjoyed that conversation. Are you going to do it? Are you going to start a uh, side hustle of growing chickens? I think it's a few years off, Joe. But I did love the origin story of Delaware as a chicken powerhouse. That was amazing. Okay, so there's a the story turns dark. Have you, read, have you do you know the full story? Then? No. So Wait, did the senator leave something out? No, he didn't leave anything out. 
is just uh, it's just an interesting sort of macabre ending to the story. So according to uh, I read online, Cecile Longsteel, uh, this is according to um, the Delaware Women's Hall of Fame. So she accidentally she started this chicken empire in Delaware in 1923 because she ordered 50 chicks and accidentally got 500. Right. And so she uh, she became this huge uh, chicken magnate in Delaware. <laughs> and then she grew. You know that famous thread about like the tomatoes where it's like, oh. Yes. So she kind of did that because then oh, she, she- She got 500 chickens and they all had yeah, five so the, baby chicks and, and it just multiplied. T- exactly. And then she then, after, you know, once she got going a year later and she realized that this was uh, taking off, then she ordered a thousand chicks. They became very rich. They, it sounds okay. It sounds good. Uh, and then they were uh, her husband, David Wilmer Steele, was actually elected to the state senate. Hmm. Also good. Uh, then they, they bought a yacht. Okay. And then uh, in uh, 1940, uh, uh, the yacht exploded accidentally. Oh, my gosh. And uh, Cecile and her husband, all the guests were fine, but uh, both Cecile and her husband were killed in it. So anyway, uh, what seemed like a sort of like for happy, fortunate thing, and the, oh, it's like this like accidental order, becoming a chicken magnate, getting rich, getting elected to the state senate, buying a yacht, uh, had an unhappy ending. That's sad. On a happier note. So maybe you don't want to, uh, you know. There, because there, I might die. On, I might become really rich and die on my Don't buy yacht. a yacht. All right. Noted. Noted risk factor. But I did think it... It was a really interesting discussion, the way he sort of described the landscape yes. of the American poultry yeah. industry. And I had heard about that business model. He described the contract poultry farming before. And I believe there are some, well, there are some tensions between small scale growers and the larger companies like a Tyson or a Purdue or whatever. We should dig into that. Yeah, definitely market structure questions, because there are all these things about both that particular structure of growing, but then there are also questions about industry concentration in the stockyards and who mm. uh, things like that. So there's plenty more to do uh, on this topic. Yeah. In the meantime, you know who has really good chicken feet? Who? Tim Ho Wan. And they're in New York now. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Listen, I their love... original store was in Hong Kong. Yeah. And they've opened a couple here and they're really good. I'm a big, I love eating uh, chicken feet. Okay. So let's do it. Chicken feet excursion. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Senator Chris Coons. He's at Chris Coons. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dashiell Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of the Bloomberg podcasts under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post transcripts, a blog, and a newsletter. And to talk about all of these topics, chat with fellow listeners 24-7 in the Odd Lots Discord, discord.gg slash Odd Lots. Really fun place to uh, hang out. And if you enjoy Odd Lots, if you like our discussions of the poultry market, then please leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening. 